Um, very good. I uh, had a, a very, very good training session today. Um, being at PC Place and this stadium is, is amazing. Uh, obviously, it brings back some old memories from eight years ago uh, when it was the World Cup final. Um, but it's been good. Uh, team have pulled out well since the, the last game. Uh, a lot of video sessions to look at details from that game, what we learned. Um, a lot of small group sessions, subgroup meetings, individual meetings, and then two very good trainings, especially today. Um, the intensity in our 11 side today and, and the focus on training today looked, uh, looked very sharp. So it's been good preparations. Tony Neal Davidson from the Canadian Press. You were quite open before the Langford game with the kind of uh, lineup you were going to field. Uh, will it be a diff? What, what are your thoughts before this game, and uh, will it be a different uh, look, Australian? Uh, not a different look in terms of identity and what we're trying to do, but a different look in terms of lineup. Uh, yes. Um, I, I try to do a better job explaining going into this camp in, in advance why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but as a coach, you know what it's like when, when you lose a game. Either you get criticised for not explaining what you're doing or you get criticised for the explanation you gave. That, that's how it works when you lose losing five mil in this game. And, and as long as that criticism is to me, it's fine. But I think we need to, to be very respectful for these players. I think they were extremely professional in this last game to go all in and try things. And, I also credit the experienced players and my support staff around to create a safe space for these young players to be out there and, and play this game. And I know some play, some people probably go like, "Hey, do you, you know, is this fair to the players to, to give them this type of experience? Uh, they love it. This is what they want. They want to play against top teams. They want to learn. And as long as I make sure I create a safe space for them uh, to get this experience, it's it's what they need. And then I wanted to balance that with the opportunity to have some continuity as well in a lineup because this is might be the only camp before the Olympics when we can play a top ranked uh, nation because it's difficult scheduling now with all the teams being locked in to schedule all the way up this might be the only window and then I felt I wanted to really try young players against the top team but also get some continuity and consistency and then the final thing I want to say is I always, always going to consider player welfare and well-being and we had to have some load management in this camp as well to protect players that have had tremendous amount of load before the camp and after the camp. Tony, what is it about Adriana Leon that seems to cause your team some havoc and how can you slow her down so she does not continue to score against your team? Well, you found something there that we've looked at as well. Um, she's been hurting us with her well-timed runs in behind the back line. Uh, she's been very efficient in, in scoring once you get the opportunity there as well. So, uh, is there an expression sometimes when you say you play a, a boogie team that sometimes you have trouble playing some teams, but maybe that's our boogie player, uh, you know, the player that we, we struggle playing against. But that's what we really need to be exposed to. These fast pacey players that have the, the ability to break the, the back line with well-timed runs and good finishing and normally the best way to stop them is actually to stop the pass that goes to her because uh, once she does hit that run she's very difficult to stop so we need to look into the, the pathways to her as well and see if we can stop the pass before it's even played. With Christine Sinclair coming in in the last game, what were you seeing about? Obviously, you know, don't let her, you know, face turn up, turn and face a goal. But like her ability to also track back, there were some times where she was forcing turnovers with her runs back into the midfield, and you know, pressuring Katrina and that sort of thing. What were you guys seeing from her that she's still able to execute more in that defensive role? Oh, it's actually interesting you mentioned that. I was. Um Looking at it myself, thinking, you know, this is a player, maybe the last camp, you don't want to get injured, you want to go out there, get some minutes, some touches on the ball, and then, you know, get out of the game in a healthy way, but not seeing, she's competing, right? Doesn't matter what the score is, she comes in and she gives it 100 on both sides of the ball, and I think that says a lot about her as a player, but also about Canada as a team. Uh, it's an extremely hard-working team on, on both sides of the ball, and I think we're going to see the same thing tomorrow. Before the game, I hope that we can be a part of honouring her, because I think that really the respect she deserves and all the players wants to do it as well. But I said it before, the, the best way to respect her once the game starts is to make it a game, a proper game and really compete because that's what she wants. Tony, you talked about creating a safe place. Or a safe, sorry, Tony. 
Yeah, no worries. You talk about creating a safe uh, space or a safe place for players. Was that not a consideration going into game one? Why is that a consideration of game two? But it felt like it may not have been game one. Yeah, I think maybe I expressed myself a bit bad there because what I did reference was game one, meaning to, to get a lot of young players out there in game one with less experience and very few caps, it's important that I give a safe space for those players to go out and play that game no matter the score. It's extremely important so that they can come off the field, even if it's a loss with 5 nil, to feel I learned something from this. Um, and it's not that I'm going to judge them to say, hey, they're not good enough to play at this level. It's more that they needed to taste this level to get a taste out of it and feel what it's like. So when they go back to Clubland now or play for a U23 national team or U20 even, they know what it takes to play at this level or when they come back to here as well. Um, and that's what I meant by saying safe space. I may by express myself a bit bad there. Because um, I think it's very important when you have such a young, inexperienced team that you really give them that safe space to perform. And we even said, try. Like if you get dispossessed, for example, three goals we got conceded by getting dispossessed in our own half. I would never blame that individual player for that uh, mistake. It's on me. You know, we, I really pushed them to the limit to try things in this game, to see where we're at and what that looks like against a top 10 ranked opponent. And I think the players committed tremendously to them. So, so credit to them, and that's what I mean. It's up to me now to protect them. And if someone should be criticised, it should be me. Uh, I can take those hits. That's up to me to protect the space for the players to really develop. Tony, two games on, on the short term, which I'm sure is a bit unusual. Um, what's your take on the artificial term we'll be playing on Tuesday night? Yeah, well, we, we were surprised how good you can play on it today. The, the, quali the technical quality today was very, very good for the players. But I know the players expressed a, a frustration from the last game, that they thought it was very difficult, especially the ones that played on grass week in and week out. We have a few players that play in Sweden that have experience playing on turf week in and week out, that it's been a bit easier for them to, to adjust than for some of the players that play consistently on grass. Personally, I've experienced it before in the, in the World Cup 2015. Uh, but what it also adds, it, it adds another dimension about player safety and load management because um, to change surfaces, not turf per se, but to change surfaces from one to another, same thing when you play on grass, if you go from a soft grass field to a firm, you can get reactions and be a bit sore and, and the injury risk increases. So that's been, been a part of the load management as well to see who needs longer to adjust the bodies to the change of surface so that we can again look at play safety and load management as much as possible. But I think the technical quality today was, was good. Okay, so we'll go to questions through Zoom. Isabel? What? Sorry. Oh, uh, Isabel, you can go ahead. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to ask, we've obviously said about the um, load management and things like that, is there anyone unavailable tomorrow? Uh, we have uh, a question mark um, with one player not training today that we'll get an answer of uh, this afternoon and then one player that after about 40 to 45 minutes today to load manage we, we took her off in the last 15 minutes to minimize the load today to be available tomorrow so one one and a half question marks that I'll get answered for tomorrow but I don't want to reveal what names that is to, to give away too much about the lineup. She is one of those that I just mentioned. Gosh, you're doing a good job here. <laughs> That's correct. She was resting from training today, so hopefully she's available tomorrow. We have a meeting tonight with my Triple team. You've been asked a lot about the Swedish national team. I'm wondering if you have a thought on Caroline Sager or not Yeah, actually, there were some players in, in our team that played with her as well that I know reached out and you know want to honor her the best way possible. She's one of the biggest players ever played the game. Um, I know how much she's meant to, to the national team. Uh, I had the privilege to coach her in Tudorsa. She was my captain there during that time. Um, so when this camp is over, I'm definitely going to pick up the phone and, and talk to her and, and kind of congratulate her on her amazing career. Tom, you can go ahead. Uh, hi, Tony. Um, what have you done with the, the younger players since the game, the ones who played, who may be wondering you know, what that experience does to them? How have you conveyed what you said about it, it being a safe space, but also that you're not going to judge them on that game per se, um, to make them feel comfortable with, with how they played? That's a great question, Tom. First of all, I think it's what you do before the game. 
to make sure that you communicate for, even before the game why we're doing it, what we're doing, and why you're giving them the opportunity. And to be clear, the reason why a lot of them were out there is because they deserved it. They've been phenomenal in terms of developing as players. They're ready to experience that now, to get that experience. And um, then you could say, you know, it has to be, again, you're trying as a coach to do all these puzzles right and get everything right. Sometimes you get it right, sometimes wrong, but we're paid to make the decision in advance what we think is best for the team and sometimes you want to balance them with an experienced player next to them sometimes you want to to look at as you know balanced right side left side back line midfield line to have a balance on it and then you want to balance also to protect player load and look at consistency in the lineup so let's say for example i would have had two mixed teams this camp there would have been some benefit in terms of more stable performance in one of the games but it also would have challenged me in terms of play load and play welfare, but also maybe lose the opportunity of some continuity and consistency in one of the games. Uh, but then post the performance, it's always me together with my staff, uh, whether that is my assistant coach that I work closely in U23 with some of the players like Emil Andrieta, that I know I'd had plenty of individual talks, there had been video session. We had a meeting yesterday and today with that group that played and took learnings from the game and sat down and discussed how it felt, what we can do better. Um, so it, it's just, I think that is not just one fix in one talk after the game. It's over time what space we have created in this national team with, with a player-centric approach that is safe for the players. Uh, and I need to credit my staff and the experienced player for helping me create that environment. So hopefully, I think when you play, talk to those players that play that game, they're not going to be mad about that lineup or mad about getting the opportunity or frustrated or scared or scarred. They're going to be like, hey, this was really valuable for me. This is really what I needed. I got a lot of answers. I feel the support from the players, from the coaching staff, and I'm going to bring this experience with me when I leave camp as well and be hungry for more. Joey, you can go ahead. Um, Tony, how you doing? Um, you talked about all that video review and the like you're doing. And looking back at the game, didn't have a shot on goal until Mary came on and had that shot, I think it was 73rd, 74th minute. When you're going back and looking at your patterns of play and how you look to build up, obviously one of the biggest reasons was it was a second choice 11. But when you're examining how you tried to build up and play out from the back and get something going offensively, what did you learn about your, I mean, your formation or your approach that maybe previously was obfuscated by you playing a first choice 11? What did you learn about the actual system from the game? Well, I think you identified exactly what we tried, and that's why we went a little bit extreme in this game. Like, if that would have been a World Cup game, it's all about reading where is the space, play that space, and, you know, if game management as well, right? And, and avoid playing into pressure, especially a team like Canada. But we know that part of the game we've shown that we're really good at, playing around and player over. We've been very, very good at that, and breaking that last line, even with control, whether it's around or over. But we've also seen that we've struggled a little bit to play through lines, uh, which means come Olympics, uh, we don't want to be as predictable uh, in our attack and we want to improve playing through. Then as a coach, when I emphasize things in training, it can tend to just be that. And what we did learn is that we did force it through when maybe we should have played around and over. And it's the classic decision making, right? So that has nothing to do with, with the type of lineup it is. It's about the decision making and, and also take some ownership for me as a coach, because you, you know what it's like to, when you focus on something, you tend to just do that. So we looked at a lot of patterns to, to play through and activate the sixes behind the forwards and break the first line and second line when maybe we could have break in three lines with one passes and we're in. So we lost a little bit of our verticality and, and I think it's because I emphasized so much about trying to improve these areas about breaking the first and second line. So what we've done these two days is to look at pictures and say, let's practice the decision making and make sure we play what's on. Uh, there's a couple of sequences when we play through lines that is very good uh, in the, that first game. Uh, but as you saw, we struggled to get out of our own half a lot. But we choose not to just push up and go long and play a second ball game. We choose to go all in in that game. And it cost us three goals and getting dispossessed in own half. So it'll be interesting to see tomorrow if we can take that learning experience and improve. But it might be cost some tomorrow as well. We might do some mistakes tomorrow as well and, and maybe even cost us a goal or two. But we, we're in the process now where we really, really want to work on this to take the team to the next level. Then we park this so-called development camp and go into qualifiers in February and say, OK, this is where we are right now. So we need to play this way 
to win the qualifying. And then we can pick up kind of the development hat again in April and June, and then we check back into performance in Olympics. And I, you know me, I've, I've talked about that before, and that's not an excuse of losing, because we always want to win a game, but we don't want to try to win a game by the expense of not developing to take this team to the next level. And I know there's going to be some growing pains and probably a lot of criticism uh, through that process. Um, and I'm happy to take that as long as we respect the players that, that they do the best. Anna? Yeah, hi, Danny. Um, hope you're well. Uh, just a couple of things. <clears throat> Firstly, uh, you obviously flag you're going to have a very strong uh, lineup out there for this game. Um, and can we expect to see that possession style that alluded to it just then? that you were talking about pre-camp. And also, we know it's going to be an emotionally charged game for Canada and Christine Sinclair. Um, how do you, uh, I guess, get that emotion out of it and, and crush the party? Um, we'll start with the f end of the question, meaning Sinclair. I, I think these players are very experienced uh, when it comes to handling emotions, whether it's that kind of do a die game against Canada in the World Cup or whether it's bouncing back from a loss uh, previously when we've been in this situation or whether it's a big occasion with a lot of, of people. I've heard there's a lot of tickets sold for tomorrow as well as so I think the atmosphere is going to be amazing. Um, but I also know the players are professional that before the game is going to be a lot of honouring, a lot of emotions and you know, thank her for the career and really respect the honouring. But once the kickoff goes and the referee blows the whistle and we're going to play 90 minute football, I know they're going to be all in playing. And when it comes to the, the first part of the question, meaning the possession-oriented style, I, I try to tend to not use a possession style word because that's not what we're about. We're a very vertical team that want to break lines, uh, leaning forward, playing forward, breaking lines, being vertical. But we want to be vertical with control when we break lines. So I rather use the word progression style, meaning progress the ball up the field, whether that's through a round or over. But we really want to break lines and play forward and, and create as many opportunities as possible to break the last line, which we know we're one of the best teams in the world to do. Whether that's a give and go out wide or up back through, or whether it's a diagonal ball over or take on one we one. But I, we want to improve the times we get to those positions. Um, whether it's bouncing from a 10 to 6 and then play, whether it's finding the 6 and go diagonal, whether it's combination wide, that's a lot of, of terminology from a coach now, sorry, but you know, just connecting to your question there. So try to stay away, away from the possession style because we don't just want to keep the ball for the sake of keeping the ball. We're a goal scoring machine that want to score a lot of goals and attack a lot and play vertical. These are just tools to be able to do that more often. Final question. Adam? Thank you, and Tony, just a quick one. Uh, I wanted to pick up on what you mentioned about the focus of camps from sometimes development, sometimes tactical. Do you have anything officially with this team before the qualifiers in Uzbekistan, or was this, is this going to be the last time we're together until then? Last time we were together before the qualifiers. Um, so that is a, you know, it's a long break between this one and February, and, and we looked at this as as one of the few times before the Olympics where we could actually do some development work to invest in the way we play. Um, and to give an answer that, for example, in training content, normally in a FIFA window, we spend equal amount of time in each phase of play. You know, whether it's the organized defending phase, the attacking organized, whether it's the transition defensively attacking, whether it's set plays, normally it's equally spent in a FIFA window. But this window we have spent maybe 85 to 90 percent on our build-up phase. Um, and I think you could also see that a little bit in our defending in the last game, that it was on the expense a little bit on the defending. But we felt we really needed to use this window and invest in that number one development area that we feel we need to work on, especially against the top 10 ranked team. So this is the last, last window before the qualifiers in October. Oh, sorry, in February. Thank you. And then just to make sure that we're doing as appropriate of a job as possible, highlighting some of the stars on this team um, for our Canadian audience. So I was just wondering if you might be able to share uh, a thought or two on Haley Razzo this year from her sort of Australian record setting move to Real Madrid. And when Sam's in the team, Sam deserves a ton of credit. But Haley, I don't want to call her under the radar anymore. But what has she meant to this group and what have you made of her year? 
I, I am really, really impressed with Haley's ability to come in and perform in the national team, even though she has had very little playing time in City before the World Cup. If you look at her, normally when you see a player flying in club land, they bring that international team and they're flying in the national team. She was in a very tough situation when it comes to playing time and confidence in club land, but could directly, when she come into our environment, be a confident player that performed. And I'm also happy the way we managed to, to really pinpoint her role for us, because as a national team coach, it's all about identifying the strength of players and get the right players in the right position with the right mindset. That's, that's what it's all about. 95% of the development happens in clubs. So I need to pick the right players in the right position with the right mindset. And to feel that we got it that right with Russell and her being, being so efficient in that role, I think her World Cup was like a breakthrough tournament for her. And then see the move to Real, she scored some goals. She's been a little bit in and out in the lineup, but she gets playing time. And then seeing every time she comes into our environment that she knows exactly her role, she knows we believe in her, she knows what to do, and the players know how to play off of her as well. So uh, I'm intrigued to, to see her play tomorrow. I think she can be a, a weapon for us. Thank you, Tony. That'll conclude today's press conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, everyone. Thanks in the room. Thanks in the Zoom as well. Thanks, everyone.